The last discussion looked at Roman relationships with Carthage, and in particular, the interactions that Rome had with Carthage in the period between 264 and 202 BC, the period of the First and Second Punic Wars. Carthage represented the most significant rival to Rome in the central Mediterranean and western Mediterranean, and after Rome's victory over Carthage in 202, Rome had effectively neutralized Carthage as a really significant source of resistance to Rome's ability to project power across the western and central Mediterranean. It had not only absorbed Carthaginian territory in the central islands of Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, but it had also expelled uh, Carthage from Spain and had reduced Carthaginian power over a lot of the territory in North Africa, and finally actually reduced Carthage to a alliance structure that bound Carthage to Rome and prevented Carthage from having any ability to even defend itself without Roman approval. But the war with Carthage also had the effect of dragging Rome into relationships and interactions with the city-states and kingdoms of the Greek world. Uh, and it's important then to pause and consider what is this Greek world that Rome is interacting with? When we think about classical Greece, it's natural to think of the great polis societies, the city-states of Athens and Sparta, that dominated uh, and generally controlled the direction of political life in the Aegean region in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. But these are not the states that Rome dealt with. Uh, when Rome is dealing with the Greek world, it's actually dealing with a world that's shaped not by Athens and Sparta, but by Philip of Macedon and his uh, son Alexander the Great. This is a world that is not the classical Greek world, it's what's called the Hellenistic world. And so to understand Rome's interaction with Greece, we have to understand what the Hellenistic world is. And the Hellenistic world begins with the conquests of Alexander the Great. Now, Philip of Macedon had a very successful career reducing the independence of the polices in the Greek world and establishing Macedon as the dominant player in the Aegean region. But it's with Alexander the Great, who takes power after the death of his father in 334 BC, that we see Greek power really projected in a dramatic way across the eastern Mediterranean and then ultimately across an expansive territory stretching all the way to India. And Alexander did this very, very quickly. He takes power in 334. By 323, this is the empire that Alexander controls, more territory than any human had ever controlled before in history. But Alexander dies at the young age of 31, um, apparently of perhaps uh, malaria or maybe alcohol poisoning or some other fever or something else in Babylon. And he had spent very little time thinking about how to govern this territory and even less time thinking about who would succeed him. Uh, and when Alexander dies, he leaves a very unstable succession situation. He had a young half-brother and an infant son, neither one of whom was able to project the sort of authority that would allow them to actually control this territory. And so soon after Alexander's death, the empire breaks apart in a series of long civil wars. And eventually, the kingdoms, uh, the Hellenistic world, the kingdoms of Alexander and his successors are broken up into large concentrations of power centered on different regions in what was once Alexander's empire. So what we see here is what the, what the world looked like in 301 BC. So if you look to the, you look to the west and you can see in that light blue, you can see the Roman Republic. Um, and because we're in 301 BC, of course, Rome has not yet fought Tarentum. Uh, and so the kingdom of, or the city of Tarentum and the uh, Syracuse and uh, the other states that we've talked about Rome exercising dominion over, they are still independent. Uh, you see the very far left, the kind of gray, this is Carthaginian territory. And then you see the great Hellenistic kingdoms. Uh, you see the kingdom of the Seleucids. This is the kind of gold color. Uh, you, well, the yellowish gold color. You see the kingdom of the Ptolemies based in Egypt. Uh, and then you see the kingdom of Lysimachus and the kingdom of Cassander. And these are the pieces of that great kingdom, that great empire that Alexander had built up. Um, by 240, what we see is that these places have kind of settled into a structure that shows uh, divisions, um, but some indication that there's some rationality to how this is working now. So the Ptolemaic Kingdom is centered on Egypt, but extends out 
uh, along the coast all the way up to what's now basically Lebanon and Syria, uh, along with some naval outposts in the southern part of uh, Asia Minor. The Kingdom of the Seleucids extends basically from um, almost Afghanistan all the way through to the Aegean. Uh, and then you see in the Greece, uh, in Greece proper, you see the Kingdom of Antigonus. Uh, and so these are the successor kingdoms that emerge. Uh, but also what's interesting is in places um, that are now India, Pakistan, and parts of Afghanistan, uh, what we see is another successor kingdom that is in some ways connected strongly to what um, the Greek world had brought to those areas, but also in many ways distinct. So to give a sense of what this place is like, it's important to uh, consider that as you look to the West, these territories like Alexandria and Egypt, um, like the Seleucid Empire in Syria, uh, some of the city-states in Asia Minor, these are places that get a very strong input, input of Greek immigrants coming from the mainland of Greece uh, and coming to serve as a ruling aristocracy or a ruling class in these regions. And so the farther west you go, the more actually Greek penetration and the more um, Greek language and Greek culture and uh, Greek cultural engagement is occurring. But as you look to the east, to places like Bactria, what we see is actually something quite interesting. There are not many Greeks migrating to this region, but Greek still remains the kind of artistic and actually... Uh, official lingua franca. And so this region can, is called Gandharan. This is a region that is Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, and when you look there, you see some very interesting fusions of Greek and native ways of representing things uh, that indicate that what you have in the Hellenistic period is actually very much a fusion of cultures. Uh, and so these are some examples of materials that come from Gandharan. Uh, so on the upper left, you see a statue. It's a Greek-style statue of a Buddha. Uh, this is now in Tokyo, but it actually comes from an area in Pakistan. Uh, you also see a procession, a uh, Buddhist procession, with people dressed in Greek clothing. And something that helps us understand this even better is a coin issued by a man named Menander. Uh, a king of this kingdom of Bactria. And the coin's legend is written in Greek, Vasileos Soteros Menandoro. Menandoro. And uh, Menander is a very interesting figure because the coin is written in Greek, the portraiture is Greek, but Menander is a Greek-speaking native Greek king of Bactria who converts to Buddhism. And so what we have to understand in these Hellenistic kingdoms is there's a tremendous amount of fusion between the Greek and the non-Greek in these kingdoms in such a way that the cultures really blend. And they blend in a significant fashion. Uh, this is a real uh, moment of cultural communication and cultural borrowing where uh, something as as strong and important as Buddhism is something that a Greek-speaking king can adopt because He's exposed to it, and in his convictions, he understands that this is something that makes sense to him. Uh, and in the same way, uh, Buddhist art that's produced in this region is done in Greek artistic style simply because this is how art was done. Uh, and so it's not exactly cultural appropriation, it's instead a kind of communication and interaction that reflects a deep combining and, and uh, communication from these multicultural societies. Um, but if we look back at our map and we turn away from places like Bactria, and you can see Bactria again on this map, um, if we turn away from regions like this, what we see is the central parts of what was once Alexander's empire begin receding back into an area along the eastern Mediterranean. And there are two major kingdoms that battle with each other across much of the third century and into the second century. This is the Seleucid kingdom uh, that's based in Syria or centered in Syria uh, and the Ptolemaic kingdom that's based in Egypt. And you see here the kingdoms in 240 BC. Um, but these kingdoms are notable for a couple of things. And each one is engaging in different ways with the Greek legacy and the non-Greek legacy of the people under their control. Uh, so in the Seleucid King, Seleucid Kingdom, what we see are um, moments where there's tremendous pressure to try to force people to adapt to Greek practices. 
Um, in particular, at one moment, Antiochus II, a Seleucid king, uh, takes control of, of what's now Israel and Palestine from the Ptolemies and uh, tries to force Jews in that region to adopt, to adopt Hellenic Greek religious practices. Uh, and this prompts a rebellion that ultimately leads to the Maccabean Revolt and the overthrow of Seleucid control in Israel. Um, the Ptolemaic dynasty in some ways is actually even more interesting. This is a dynasty that's named after its founder, Ptolemy I. Uh, and they controlled Egypt, and their center, the center point of their power was actually in Egypt. Uh, and they did it from the city of Alexandria, a city founded, of course, by Alexander the Great. Um, but unlike the Seleucids, what the Ptolemies tried to do, because Egypt is a, a place that is easily centralized, all of the major cities, all of the major um, communities in Egypt are based along the Nile Valley. And so it's a very easy place to have central control over. What the Ptolemies tried to do is work with the very strong native Egyptian understanding of monarchy, um, going all the way back to the Pharaonic period, uh, and create a way to articulate Greek monarchy uh, and a Greek king ruling over an Egyptian, a largely Egyptian um, population. And so in Alexandria, the capital, this is a Greek city with a substantial population of people who speak Greek. The main language spoken in Alexandria is Greek. Uh, Ptolemy even um, allows or encourages the migration of a lot of Jews coming from areas in Israel and Palestine uh, to settle in Alexandria. And these Jews, too, come and speak Greek, and they adapt to Greek culture. Uh, but what we also see with the Ptolemies is the... Um, way in which they explain their power and the way in which they demonstrate their authority over Egypt is something that blends Greek representational styles when the representational style is directed towards Greeks and this marble portrait of Ptolemy is certainly directed towards a Greek audience. This is not an Egyptian way of representing power. It's not an Egyptian artistic style. Um, but when speaking to Egyptians, what we see is there's also a very, uh, very good understanding of how to use Egyptian elements that can speak to that population. And so what we have here is actually a, a ring with a portrait of Ptolemy VI on it. And this, this ring uh, portrait shows Ptolemy VI wearing a pharaonic crown. And so the Ptolemies are perfectly comfortable speaking to both elements of their population. Um, and not only would they speak in, you know, different, uh, different, languages when speaking to those populations, but they'd also use different iconographies and different ways of representing their power so that these representations can communicate with different audiences in, in their own way. Now, one of the most important things that the Hellenistic period brings about is the spread of Greek cultural life across this massive region that stretches from Afghanistan all the way to what's now modern Greece. Um, and classical Greek culture is adapted and grows significantly in the Hellenistic period. So, for example, one of the most important things and one of the most memorable things that Greeks bring about is this real revolution in the way that sculpture is done. Uh, there is a, a realism, a kind of hyper-realism in Hellenistic Greek sculpture that's perhaps best seen in that statue of the, the young rider on his horse that comes from the uh, National Archaeological Museum in Athens. But you also see this in portraiture. And so this is a, a portrait of a woman um, from about 300 BC. And if we skip back to our Gontaran pictures, what we see, of course, is this is a style that's very similar to that used by the artist in the Buddha uh, on the upper left. This despite the fact that these statues are carved thousands of miles apart from each other. Um, but it's not just artistic styling that the Hellenistic world brings to a wider audience. It's also literature um, and mathematical understandings. And so this is an image of a, a document put together by the mathematician Euclid, Euclid's Elements. Um, it's a third century BC text, so it's created Euclid basically lived, um, was a sort of contemporary of Alexander the Great, who lived during the time when the Hellenistic world is just taking shape. And so Euclid's Elements is a, a text that comes from basically this moment. The papyrus we have comes from Egypt. 
Uh, it comes from the city of Oxyrhynchus. Uh, the papyrus was written in 100 AD, so after the Hellenistic period. But what you see here is the very natural spread of information, development of information uh, across this space that has now been unified politically by Alexander the Great and his successors. And the important thing about the Hellenistic period is these elements of Greek culture that are brought about and, and communicated and transmitted into these new areas that Greeks have taken control of, in the Hellenistic period, knowledge of these things gets better. They continue to develop the tools to do things like high-level mathematics. They continue to do things like develop the tools to do high-level medical studies. Uh, so Hippocrates comes from the classical Greek period, but some of the next generation and some of the most famous uh, ancient doctors are actually practicing in Alexandria in the Hellenistic period. Um, and this extends beyond just medicine. It extends even to things like this. This is a, a really fascinating material, uh, a piece of material evidence for Greek intellectual achievements. This is something that's called the Antikythera device. And basically what we figured out that this is, is it's a, effectively an analog computer. Uh, and so you can see that these, uh, it, this, doc, this object has lots of writing on it. If you look closely, you can see in the, um, the slide in the center, you can see Greek lettering on this. You can see all kinds of gears. Now, the Antikythera device was found in a shipwreck around 19, or a little bit after 1900. And so this is, a di this is an object that has, of course, corroded significantly. Um, it not only suffered damage in the shipwreck, but it also sat under the ocean for probably 2,000 years. Um, and yeah, even so, what we can see is that there are a significant amount of gears and um, other mecha mechanisms in this that allows that allows the operator to perform really sophisticated calculations, uh, and this is also typical of the Hellenistic period. This is a this is an object from the second century BC. So we're now you know two hundred years into the Hellenistic period, and intellectual products, um, the production of engineers and mathematicians and scholars, uh, this has continued in the Hellenistic period. It hasn't just uh, seen Greece recede from the height of the classical, the heights of the classical period. Instead, what we've seen in the Hellenistic period is Greek understanding, knowledge, and techniques have continued to improve and create much more sophisticated things. Um, and of course, the Romans saw this, and the Romans had access to some of this material. Um, and they were envious because Romans didn't have any native culture uh, that focused on these kinds of things. Romans were not people who created things like the Antikythera device. Um, they didn't even have an advanced literary culture. And so when Romans come into contact with Greek culture, um, it, it happens in some ways through the natural communication of different peoples, but it also happens because of a series of wars that begin in the late third century BC. And so Rome really comes to terms with the Hellenistic world and really begins to adapt and adopt some of these aspects of the Hellenistic world because Rome has come into conflict and has become a entity that projects power into this world. In a sense, these developments find Rome because Roman military power forced it to come into conflict with Greek powers. And Roman victories over these Greek powers gave Rome exposure to a lot of this stuff. Now, by the end of the third century BC, Rome had, of course, had extensive contacts with the Greek world for a very long time. If we think back all the way to the king uh, Tarquinius Priscus, Tarquinius Priscus was half Greek. Um, you know, he he was descended from Greeks. Um, and so Rome, for a very long time, had interacted with the Greek world. But Rome had not actually fought with the cities and kingdoms in the Hellenistic world um, until the Second Punic War. And during the Second Punic War, what brings Rome into conflict with these people is uh, following the Battle of Cana in 216 BC, Hannibal makes an alliance with the King Philip of Macedon. Um, now, Mas the Macedonian kingdom is 
the core of what Alexander's empire had once been. Um, Alexander had expanded out of the kingdom of Macedonia and conquered all of this territory. But in the breakup of Alexander's empire, the kingdom of Macedon kind of contracted back into its original shape, plus some of the territory that Philip II had won for it, preceding Alexander's conquests. Uh, and so this is the kingdom that Hannibal appeals to. Um, and in 215 BC, the Macedonian kingdom declares war on Rome. Now, it's pretty clear what Hannibal thought would happen. Um, what Hannibal expected was the Macedonian kingdom would attack Rome. Um, Rome had a few protectorates and a few holdings across the Adriatic Sea from southern Italy. Um, and you can see on the map the dark green. These are Roman territories in 200 BC. Um, this territory was something that Macedonia coveted, but what Hannibal was expecting is Macedon would attack these Roman, um, th these Roman territories and then land an army in southern Italy to reinforce Hannibal, and together the Carthaginians and the Macedonians would knock Rome out. But what Rome was able to do was instead uh, make alliances with Greek city-states and leagues of Greek city-states that already had a bone to pick with Macedon. Um, and so Roman forces uh, created an alliance with Greek city-states um, in the Aetolian League. And so if you look at this map, you see the Aetolian League, and, and you see that it's uh, you know, more or less centered around the southern periphery of the Macedonian kingdom. Uh, it looks small. The Macedonian kingdom looks far larger than this, but this is a group of city-states that can fight very effectively and did fight very effectively against the Macedonians. Uh, in the meantime, the Romans uh, launch a couple of short uh, attacks against Macedon in this area, uh, and then they destroy the Macedonian navy that prevents the Macedonians from coming into southern Italy. Finally, the Aetolian League gets tired of Rome basically not helping them very much in this war, and in 206 BC they make a peace treaty with Macedon. Rome then feels compelled in 205 BC to make its own peace treaty with Macedon because it doesn't, it simply doesn't want to fight in that area. And so the first Roman-Macedonian War is a war that basically involves very little actual fighting between Romans and Macedonians. Uh, after this, though, Philip turns his attention to the east. Uh, and after a series of really problematic harvests in Egypt and some um, really serious domestic disturbances in Egypt, Philip and the Seleucid king uh, begin planning a series of campaigns to knock out territories that were under the control of the Ptolemies. And eventually, uh, it's thought probably they would knock out the Ptolemaic kingdom and split the territory that they conquered between the two of them. People, uh, Rome's allies in the Greek world and Roman allies in Asia Minor, begin warning Rome that this is a really serious problem. Um, and in 201, ambassadors of the city of Pergamum, um, even ambassadors from the city of Athens, come to Rome and they ask for assistance against Philip, who they expect is going to use the alliance with the Seleucids to completely reshape the way that the Eastern Mediterranean is functioning. Um, and they tell Rome that Philip basically was planning to ultimately use his gains from these campaigns to turn his attention back to the West and attack Rome. Uh, and Rome believes this. But what Rome doesn't want to do is actually attack Philip. They have just finished the Punic Wars. I mean, 201 BC is one year after the Battle of Zama. Um, Rome is exhausted. It doesn't really want to go to war if it can avoid it. And so in 200 BC, Rome, again, um, sends ambassadors to Philip and tells Philip that he should not attack any Greek, Greek cities, and in return, Rome won't attack Philip. Uh, and any disputes that Philip has with Greek cities should be settled by arbitration, and Rome is happy to be the arbitrator. Now, of course, Philip's reaction to this is completely to be expected. Um, Philip decides that he has already fought Rome, and Rome did nothing. Rome had very little interest in actually fighting that war. So why should Philip fear Rome when Rome is threatening Philip uh, and saying that there will be consequences if Philip attacks Greek cities? And so Philip ignores this. He keeps up his attacks on the Greeks, and the Senate then is forced to declare war on Philip. And so from 200 to 198, uh, Roman forces fight the Macedonians. Um, and then in uh, 198, the Roman commander Flamininus meets with Philip's we meets with Philip to try to reach some peace agreement. But Philip at this point is not terribly impressed with what he's seen with the Romans. 
Uh, and so Philip doesn't feel compelled to reach any agreement. Uh, and then in 197, Flamininus, his forces meet the forces of Philip at a place called Kinoscephale, a place the name literally means dog head and it refers to a uh, geological formation that kind of looks like a dog head um, in that region. Uh, and so the battle takes place and what we see is this is the first major battle between the Roman maniples and the Macedonian phalanx that is the descendant of the group of people that Alexander the Great had used to conquer the world. This is a very historically significant moment. And the Romans win the battle. What they prove is that the maniple is more flexible, it's more adaptable. And they actually use elephants that they had gotten in the peace treaty with the Carthaginians to push back the Macedonian line and then use the maniples to outflank the phalanx and defeat Philip. This victory at Kinoscephaly uh, has basically destroyed Philip's ability to project power, and the Romans force him to evacuate all of, all of the Greek areas that are outside of the, the core of the Macedonian kingdom. He had to give up his fleet, he had to keep his military small, and he had to pay an indemnity to Rome. And then in July of 196, something very dramatic happens. Uh, this is a moment when at the city of Corinth, uh, there's a regularly scheduled athletic competition called the Ithmian, Ithmian Games. And the Ithmian Games um, is, you know, in a way like the Olympics. It's a, a less prestigious version of the Olympics, but it's like the Olympics. Uh, and Flamininus at the Ithmian Games makes a speech in which he proclaims the freedom of Greece. And so this is how Livy describes the scene. At the appointed time of the games, the spectators take their seats and the herald, as is his custom, steps forward accompanied by a trumpeteer into the middle of the arena. A blast of the trumpet produces silence and the herald makes the following announcement. The Roman Senate and Titus Quinctius Flamininus, their general, having conquered King Philip and the Macedonians, decree that the Corinthians, the Phocians, the Locrians, the island of Evia, the Magnesians, the Thessalians, the Parabaeans, and the Achaeans shall be free, exempt from tribute, and subject to their own laws. This list comprised all of the states which had been subject to King Philip. Now, this is dramatic because what the Roman commander Flamininus has said is Rome will not be taking the territory that it has wrested from Philip. Rome doesn't want that territory. What Rome wants is those cities to not be part of Philip's territory, so Philip no longer has the power to threaten Rome, but it also doesn't want those cities to become part of the Roman Commonwealth. It doesn't want those cities to become um, territories under Roman domination. Those cities are to function under their own laws. They are to be free. And what we see in this, then, is a Roman declaration that it wants nothing to do with managing affairs in Greece. It's too complicated. Rome doesn't want to project power in the region. Instead, what Rome wants is simply for there to be no more problems for Rome coming from Greece. And it thinks that reducing the power of Philip will do this. I mean, instead, you'll have a group of city-states in the Greek world, and Rome can ignore them. It can interact with them to the degree is, ne is necessary, but it doesn't have to control them. It doesn't have to create structures to integrate them into the Roman commonwealth. These places will be independent, and they will collectively serve as an effective check on Philip. And this makes Flamininus so popular that the coin on you, that you see on your left is actually issued in Greece. This is a Roman. This is a Roman on a coin issued in the Greek world. And so this is the first Roman that we know of to appear in his lifetime on a coin. And it may be a coin. It may be a medal. But it's clear uh, that there is tremendous gratitude towards Flamininus for what has happened. Um, but while people rejoiced. Uh, this immediately faces, the, this arrangement that Rome has created immediately faces a, a challenge, and the challenge comes from a strange place. It actually comes from, of all places, from Sparta. 
Now, Sparta has been reduced to a bit player in the Greek world, uh, really since the middle part of the 4th century BC. We're now in the 190s. So it's been, you know, over 150 years since Sparta has really been a feature of, of the Greek world. Um, but a new king named Nabis begins building up the Spartan army and intimidating his neighbors. And consistent with the policy of Greek freedom, Flamininus then fights the Spartans. Um, and in some ways, you would think this would be kind of a legendary battle, right? The Roman maniples against the, the Spartan phalanx and, you know, the, the heroic past of the classical Greek world now resurrecting itself to confront the Romans now that the Macedonians have been pushed back. Uh, but in reality, the Romans don't have very much trouble in putting down the Spartans. This is not an even fight at all. Uh, but the importance of the of the victory over the Spartans is simply to say that Rome is willing to enforce this freedom of Greece. Um, and Flamininus remains in Greece for another period of time just to make sure that everybody understands that Greece is in fact free. And then he withdraws and he leaves Greece to the Greeks. And this proves to be a really significant mistake um, because the Aetolian League, which had been Rome's ally in the First Macedonian War, is very upset about this. Um, the Aetolians felt like they fought alongside Rome and they should get some of the benefits of the victory because they were Rome's allies. Um, and this is how things had done, had, had functioned, um, you know, with Rome's Italian allies. So why is Rome's Greek allies being, uh, why are Rome's Greek allies being kind of held out to dry when they too fought alongside the Romans and expect some rewards for their victories? And so the Aetolian League then appeals to the Seleucids. Uh, and you see on this map the kingdom of the Seleucids. Um, now, the, the appeal to the Seleucids is something that the Seleucids decide to accept because, again, Rome is withdrawn. So the Seleucids feel like there's a power vacuum. If Macedonia is reduced, well, then that offers opportunities for other people to come in and fill the vacuum that was left by the Macedonians. Uh, and so the Seleucids in 192 land a force in Greece. Uh, this is bad enough because it's a direct challenge to the freedom of Greece that Rome has proclaimed. But even worse, one of the generals who goes along with this force is Hannibal. So after the victory over Carthage in the Second Punic War, Hannibal is actually empowered by Scipio Africanus in a kind of chivalrous way uh, to serve as a kind of leader of the reconstruction of Carthage. And Hannibal does this as a, a kind of good citizen um, and he starts trying to reform some of the corruption in Carthaginian society. But this leads to an unlikely alliance between Carthaginians suspicious of Hannibal and Romans suspicious of Hannibal. Ultimately, they force Hannibal out of the city of Carthage, and Hannibal becomes a kind of high-priced soldier of fortune um, and ends up with the Seleucid king. Uh, but the problem that the Seleucid king has by landing Hannibal uh, leading a force in an area that the Romans are guarding the and protecting the uh, political security and stability of, uh, this is a direct challenge to Rome that Rome is going to take very seriously. Uh, and so the Romans react really dramatically. They make an alliance with Philip of Macedon. They make an alliance with the Achaean League, another collection of Greek states that oppose the Aetolians. They even get Carthage to join the alliance so that they too um, will potentially lend support to the war against their own citizen Hannibal. The Romans then push through Greece. The Seleucids offer a kind of token resistance at uh, Thermopylae and then they withdraw. And they offer to make peace and restore the status quo. Uh, but Rome at this point is so angry at the provocation, not only the provocation of landing in Greece, but the provocation of doing this with Hannibal in your army, that Rome does not accept this. They said the only acceptable terms would be the surrender of the new territories that the Seleucids have occupied in Asia Minor and the payment for the full cost of the war. So the Seleucids turn this down. And in 190 BC, the Roman army meets a Seleucid army at a place called Magnesia in Asia Minor. Uh, and there, they are led by Scipio Africanus and his brother, and the Roman troops destroy the, the Seleucid forces and defeat Hannibal. And ultimately, in 188, they sign a treaty. And this is a very interesting treaty because it's a treaty that does force the Seleucids, as the Romans said, to vacate much of the territory in Western Asia Minor that they had seized. 
um, they are forced to pay a massive sum, a massive penalty to the Romans. Uh, it's 15,000 talents, which equates to the daily wage for 90 million workers. This is a massive amount of money. Um, but again, Rome is not prepared or interested in administering this territory. So even though a Roman victory has forced the Seleucids to leave significant amounts of territory, like the freedom of Greece, um, Rome has no interest in creating administrative structures to govern that territory on their own. And so instead what Rome does is he divi Rome divides the territory amongst Roman allies in the region, with the biggest beneficiaries being the Kingdom of Pergamum and Rhodes. And you see on this map how big the Kingdom of Pergamum and Rhodes gets largely because of the Roman victory at Magnesia. Now, it's sufficient to say that after this victory in 188, the arrangement Rome creates doesn't work very well. Um, Rome is drawn back into fighting in Greece in the 170s. Uh, the Third Macedonian War is something that begins in the 170s, and it climaxes in 168 at the Battle of Pydna. Um, and following this, Rome again withdraws. So this is a coin commemorating Milius Pallas' victory in the Third Macedonian War in 168. You can see Pallas on the bottom. You see Terror on top. In the center is a trophy with Emilius Pallas to the right. And then you see King Perseus of Macedon and his two children, uh, basically acknowledging their submission to, to Rome. Uh, and so Rome's victory in the Third Macedonian War, Rome believes this will be it. Um, what we'll do is we will divide Macedon into three independent republics. There won't be a central power in Greece anymore. We can again withdraw from Greece and we cannot. We need to not worry about this place again. Um, but there are other penalties too, because Rome is very clearly getting frustrated by Greece's in unwillingness to just manage its affairs without Rome getting involved. So the Aetolian League, which had been Rome's ally in the First Macedonian War, um, and then had been the Seleucid ally uh, in the campaign against the Seleucids, uh, they also were on the side of Macedon in the Third Macedonian War, and they're severely punished. Uh, many of their citizens are killed by Roman troops. The Achaean League also gets punished by Rome. A thousand leading citizens are deported from Achaea, and they're kept in Rome as hostages for 16 years. And their crime was simply that their name had appeared among the papers of the Macedonian king. Um, and one of those hostages is actually Polybius, who we will talk about uh, in the next lecture. Now, the goal, again, is for Rome to be able to withdraw from Greece. Uh, so that it doesn't become a problem. And holding those hostages in Rome means that the Achaeans have something to lose if they start causing a problem for Rome. But again, this arrangement is not destined to last. In 149 BC, a man who pretended to be the son of King Perseus, the Macedonian leader in the Third Macedonian War, again leads a rebellion, he reunites the kingdom of Macedon, and starts fighting the Romans. And in 148, Roman forces crush the kingdom, and finally they are frustrated. They've had enough. And so they annex Macedonia and they make it a Roman province. This indicates a really significant change in Roman approaches. Um, and it indicates a really significant change that took about 50 years for Rome to agree, to Rome to understand needed to happen. Um, all of the previous victories up until the Fourth Macedonian War had seen Rome withdraw from the Greek world. Rome really didn't want to run affairs in the Greek world if it could avoid it. But by the Fourth Macedonian War, it became clear to the Romans they couldn't avoid running affairs in the Greek world. Greeks simply would not remain under control unless the Romans controlled them. Um, and this change in Roman approach becomes even more evident two years later, uh, in the year 146 BC. Now, 146 is a momentous year in Roman history. And in it, we see the first evidence of a real dramatic desire for territorial expansion among the Romans within the Mediterranean heartland and a shift from this policy of allowing independent allies with significant resources to govern affairs in their own region because Rome didn't want to be involved. I mean, there are a few things that happened in 146. There's two major things that happened in 146 that show this shift. Um, in 146, what we see is Rome is finally ready uh, to take control of each of its major adversaries from the past 50 years. Uh, the first of these is Carthage. 
Now, in 149, a third Punic War had broken out. And unlike the situation in Greece, this Third Punic War was something that actually was not really caused by problematic behavior by the Carthaginians. Actually, the Carthaginians had behaved quite well uh, during the time of the well during the time after the Second Punic War and the peace treaty. They had followed the terms that Rome had set for them. Uh, but some individuals in Rome began pushing for a war with Carthage for a couple of reasons. First, the experience in the Greek world had clearly indicated and scared to, had indicated to Romans and scared Romans that the structure of binding Carthage in an alliance to Rome may well not be sustainable. These alliance structures are things that are changeable, whereas absolute military domination is something that, well, you at least control what's going on and you can prevent these kinds of things from getting out of control um, prematurely. And so some individuals began pushing for war with Carthage, even though Carthage really hadn't done anything. Um, but Carthage was a wealthy territory. Its territory portrayed, uh, it conveyed a, a large deal of grain, which was needed to feed Rome's growing population. And, of course, Carthage was, in the past, a major threat to Rome. So, in the treaty following the end of the Second Punic War, Carthage was allowed to keep control of some coastal cities, but it had to cede much of the territory west of what's now Tunisia to the kingdom of Numidia. And the territory that Carthage retained was supposed to be separate uh, from the Numidian kingdom. But in the 150s BC, a Numidian king named Massinissa began to attack territory that was rightfully Carthaginian. Now, as the terms of the peace treaty following the Second Punic War dictated, Carthage was not allowed to take military action, even to defend itself without Roman approval. And so it sent a message to Rome so that the Romans could arbitrate and decide who ought to hold that territory between Numidia and Carthage. One of those sent as an arbitrator was Cato the Elder. And this is Cato the Elder. Um, and Cato, when he was visiting, he saw the wealth of Carthage and he became really concerned. Um, and he immediately began pushing for war. They said that um, Cato would enter Senate meetings uh, and talk about what he saw in Carthage. So they said that shaking his toga, he purposefully let drop some African figs in the Senate. And then on admiring their size and beauty, he said that the country that produced them was only three days sail away from Rome. After this point, whenever he declared his opinion in the Senate on any matter, he added the following, and I think Carthage must be destroyed. Delenda S. Carthago. Cato was very clearly pushing Rome to attack Carthage. Uh, and as Massinissa whittled down Carthaginian territory, Cato and allies of Cato in the Senate refused to allow Carthage to do anything in response. And so Carthage did its own thing. Uh, it threw out a pro-Roman government that had, had hesitated to defend Carthaginian territory against the Numidians, it mobilized an army, and it began to fight back. And Rome then sent a force to Carthage to finally and completely reduce the city. To Romans who weren't really paying attention to Carthaginian behavior for the past 50 years, this looked like a repeat of what had gone on in Greece, a repeat of, of Macedon continually making agreements with Rome and then going back on those agreements, and Rome having to come back and continue to fight there. But for Romans, Carthage was far more frightening than Macedonia. Carthaginians under Hannibal had landed in Italy. Carthaginians under Hannibal had inflicted the most serious defeats on the Roman army that Rome had ever suffered to that point. And so conflict with Carthage was something that scared Romans irrationally in a way that conflict with Macedonia didn't. And so when Carthage began fighting to defend its own city, uh, the Roman envoys came to Carthage and they were not willing to come to an agreement that would resolve the conflict without fighting. They were terrified of what Carthage could bring about. And so when Carthage offered to make amends, Rome gave the following terms to them. Carthage had to give 300 hostages to Rome. It had to agree to obey all future orders of the consuls. It had to surrender all of its weapons. And these were terms that were very clearly uh, terms that Rome did not expect Carthage to accept. So when we, if we go back to the discussion of what uh, just war is supposed to be like in the Roman context. 
Cicero tells us that no war is just unless it's entered upon after an official demand for satisfaction has been submitted or a warning has been given and a formal declaration made. So Rome offers a demand for satisfaction that it doesn't expect Carthage will agree to. Um, what city would agree to surrender all of its weapons, agree to basically um, assent to any order that comes from Roman administrators and to also send hostages to Rome? And so Rome sets terms that it thinks Carthage won't submit to, and then Carthage submits to them. And after Carthage announces that it's going to do this, the envoys then announce the final terms. Carthage is to abandon its city and move 10 miles inland. And for a seafaring people, this is tantamount to destruction. It led to war just as the Romans expected, but the war didn't go as the Romans expected. Uh, Carthage fought far harder um, and with much more capacity than the Romans imagined. And so the war that begins in 149 BC doesn't end until 146. And after a series of reverses, Carthage is taken and it's destroyed. And we see here Cicero talking about what a victory is supposed to be like. When a victory is won, we should spare those who have not been bloodthirsty and barbarous in their warfare. And so Cicero says, this is why our forefathers admitted to full citizen rights, the Tusculans, Aquians, Volscians, Sabines, and Hernicians. But they raised Carthage to the ground. Rome raised Carthage to the ground not because of what Carthage did in the Third Punic War. It raised Carthage to the ground because of the terror Romans still felt from what Carthage had done in the Second Punic War. And so this is a, this is a penalty inflicted on Carthage that is far more severe than the conduct of the Carthaginians in the Third Punic War merited. But what we see here is like in the fourth, the victory that Rome had in the fourth Macedonian war, Rome is done allowing powerful adversaries to be independent. So not only is Carthage destroyed, raised to the ground, but the core territory around Carthage is absorbed as a Roman province. The Carthaginians lose their independence. Uh, they lose their city. Many of them lose their lives. And what a province actually represented was a space in which a Roman governor was sent out to administer the place. This is different from the Italian Roman Commonwealth, where people who are conquered are integrated into the state, they're given political rights, or they're given allied status, uh, but they're given sort of legal relationships to the Romans that give them the kind of pride of membership in the community. People living in a province are governed by someone who dominates them. So when Macedonia becomes a province, this is Rome saying, in essence, we don't trust you to be independent anymore, but we're not integrating you into our society. The same is true when Rome takes over North Africa. It makes the territory around Carthage the province of Africa, but Rome doesn't trust the people there to operate independently. Instead, they are now subjects of a Roman governor. But 146 is not just a moment when Carthage is destroyed. Because in the same year, a revolt by the Achaean League in Greece was crushed, and Rome then destroys the city of Corinth as well. And following the destruction of Corinth, Rome expelled all of the governments on the Greek mainland and forced them all to become Roman allied oligarchies who will be policed and watched over by the Roman governor of Macedon. Uh, I mean, the Roman governor of the province of Macedon has an army that he can then use to attack these cities if they get out of line. And so what we see is in the 56 years between the victory at the Battle of Zama and the destruction of Carthage and Corinth in 146, we see a very serious and significant evolution in the way that the Romans interact with the world around them. This is a process that starts with Rome wanting to withdraw back into alliance structures that don't require Romans to actually administer this territory. They want desperately to trust that their adversaries will be trustworthy and not endanger Roman interests because Rome doesn't want to be involved in these regions. But after 50 years, it becomes clear to Romans this isn't going to work. And so they fall back on something different. They fall back on a process of actual, straightforward, and absolute domination over their adversaries that had caused such problems for them in the past. This is the way that the Roman Republic, a representative democracy, builds an empire for itself. 
and this will have significant long-term implications for the stability of that Roman Republic in the future.